Welcome everybody, Talking Technophobia and Film. Uh, tonight's uh, discussion will be around the 1996 film Independence Day. Uh, based on a uh, class suggestion, uh, the title has been changed to, now that's what I call a close encounter. Um, okay, uh, a couple things uh, we could look into tonight, try to talk about. Uh, technology, as always, I like to use as a jumping off point. I think this film sets a lot up in terms of science and weaponry and the conversation that's taking place between the two in the movie. Uh, all the characters are stereotypes in this movie, one could argue, but of them, half of them are very brave and half of them are very cowardly. And we'll talk about what the film is saying about these stereotypes and these characters. Uh, in honor of uh, my engagement with future Professor, Mrs. Professor Movies. Um, we'll talk about love and whether or not uh, it has as much power as movies like, thank you, Independence Day and uh, The Matrix say it does. Uh, we'll talk about the idea of the other because this is an alien movie and often uh, this is uh, something that gets overlooked, but I think it's uh, really important, specifically given where we are today with the outsider and the other to look at and talk about. Talk about patriotism, and maybe we'll try to solve world peace. Yes, sir. Uh, and before we start, uh, uh, while we're on the base of uh, Area 51, mm -hmm. um, did anyone hear about the Facebook uh, play? Oh, yeah. Did you just, oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> segued right into Area 1. You're like, while well, we're talking about Area 51, uh, did anybody hear about Area 51 okay. pledge yeah. Facebook? Uh, I did uh, Can you tell us a little bit about it? There's, I've got. Uh, 400,000 people pledge to raid Area 51 saying they can't stop us all. <laughs> it is ants versus grasshoppers. A bug's life taught me that. Um, it's so ants versus grasshoppers. And <laughs> yeah. The ants band together, the grasshoppers don't stand a chance. And segueing from that, uh, Maybe we will talk about Area 51, uh, because under the Obama in, uh, administration, they did uh, declassify a lot of information around what's considered Area 51. And maybe people know about that and want to bring it into the discussion. Uh, my hope today is really to, matters. what's that? Except for the stuff that really matters, like, are we alone? Oh, uh, OK, yeah. Because <laughs> I, I, last I checked, we're still answering that question. Mm -hmm, right, and this movie uh, starts off with that call to adventure, right, where we get the answer to that question, are we alone? Uh, there was Battle Los Angeles had the tagline, like, we, it, was, it would have been better if we were, all right, um, is how they tried to answer it. So we'll see if this is, a, like, a theme that runs through this kind of subgenre of science fiction or not. Um, okay. This is the uh, DVD release of the film. Uh, most marketing for the film prior to its theatrical release uh, did not showcase the cast. It was uh, simply like the spaceship, uh, special effects like this. Um, and they really did, in terms of like marketing, try to build suspense as to what this movie was going to be about and what people were going to see. Um, for many people, the first time they went to this movie uh, was the first time they realized actors like Bill Pullman or Jeff Goldblum were in it. Uh, stuff about me, uh, if you want to vote on what I wear to these things, uh, you can totally do so on the uh, Instagram polls. We also did an Instagram poll about what film will be August discussion, so we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, there is rampant cheating going on on these Instagram polls, so if you care about these things, like what, what I am wearing or what we watch uh, in the following class, uh, I invite you to, to use your American right to vote and vote. Twice. Not vote twice. <laughs> vote early. Vote early, vote often. I'm not um, Because, yeah, I don't know. I would suspect that people have multiple accounts and are doing that for whatever, you know. This is how democracy works. Uh, as, a, as a child, I was really into The X-Files, um, and that made this movie really appealing to me as a small child when it came out. Uh, I, um, I think it's a statistic probability thing on where I land with the aliens. Um, I, I'd like to believe, you know, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll get into that if you'd like. Uh, all right, Independence Day. Came out in 1996. Uh, Roland Emmerich uh, directed and co-wrote this with Dean Devlin. 
Uh, they were coming off of Stargate, and from what YouTube has told me during an interview during the press junket for Stargate, he was asked about whether or not he believes in aliens, and Roland Emmerich said, I don't, but I'm really interested in that idea, and went from that discussion to starting to outline the ideas for this movie. This movie had a big cast. Um, it was released on July 2nd. A lot of uh, big names in Hollywood were in this movie. They were not huge at the time. I really believe this, more than Bad Boys, kind of cemented Will Smith as Mr. Fourth of July. Yeah. Because there was a good stretch for about half a decade or more where Will Smith had blockbuster after blockbuster every July 4th weekend. And then Wild Wild West came out. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 I really yeah. like the song, Listen, though. It spawned one of the best <laughs> fast food promotional burgers ever. Yeah. From and, Burger King. and Burger King had the glasses, too. I remember wanting them. Onion Not rings, looking good. Barbecue sauce. Mm -hmm. It had everything. Uh, That's what I'm saying. Children of the Internet. Uh, Kevin Smith gives a really good talk on YouTube about uh, when Wild West and giant robot spiders and trying to write a script for a Superman movie. That is interesting uh, if you have any interest in Wild West or Kevin Smith or Superman. Wild Wild West. Wild Wild West, you're right. Wicka Wa, Wicka Wa Wa West. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I can see the No, you don't want nothing. No, but I mean, that one scene, though, with mm -hmm. the How's Your Mama, mm -hmm. you, that was yeah, no, no, yeah. hilarious. Uh, and plus, Will Smith in drag uh, is that, something to see. Was, he did that. This movie uh, made a lot of money, uh, a modest budget of $75 million, but went on to coup uh, almost a billion. Uh, the special effects, it did win the Oscar for special effects that year. Uh, it started this wave of disaster film movies we got, uh, 2012, The Day After Tomorrow. Yes. Geostorm. These are all movies that are in the same like subgenre of this film, and Independence Day really kicked it off. And uh, the sequel came yes. out in 2016, 20 years later. I would like to not talk about the sequel. You can if you really want. Um, there's a sequel. It's called Independence Day Resurgence. Will Smith is not in it. Everybody else is. Uh, Vivica A. Fox's character, Jasmine, is a doctor by this point. She's finished med school. She's stripped her way through it, and now, um, yeah, she, yeah, there she goes. Um, I like Independence Day Resurgence in terms of the world that is presented at the onset of the movie, where you see Earth 20 years after the events of this film. That's kind of cool, because it fit in line with what I had always suspected would be the outcome post that uh, attack. Um, but if we can, let's, let's save it for the end, at least. Let's see if we got some extra time. OK, I want to take you back to 1996. Um, computers have invaded people's homes in a, really, in, a, in a way that's never been seen before. We have Windows 95 uh, making your, your home personal PC experience very different from what it was before. And at the same time, we have a marvel of technology called the internet uh, that is bringing us together like never before. And uh, this does have stuff to do with Independence Day. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So if I How many free hours did you have? I know. <laughs> I could retire on Yo, the free hours I have. Like, how, many, how many of those discs that they would mail out have like been eaten by fish. Oh man, I know. Yes. Like, I have people who are making like furniture out of them. What percentage of our bodies are AOL online discs at this point? <laughs> <laughs> Point zero zero two. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 pretty yeah. accurate. <laughs> oh man. Uh, wow. America Online. Yeah, bro. Um, I always forget how to change the slide on the video. <laughs> okay, so. America Online, I show you that commercial more so than to reference the Jetsons, uh, which is great. You know, the Jetsons did tell me that we would have flying cars by now and all that stuff. The Jetsons could be something to talk about in a, in a discussion one day. Um, but the internet gave us technology at our fingertips that allowed us to communicate with each other across the world it, in one fell swoop. After you got past the dial-up modem, you were able to connect and communicate with people completely different from you, pe people whose lives were very different. Um, and there is a great potential for this. But as we've kind of talked about in our discussions in previous classes, 
technology is neither good nor bad, it's how it's used. And the other side of that communication is the mistrust and the suspicion and the ability for people to be mean to each other. All right, the young people know what a troll is. Um, and because of this, at that time in the mid 90s, you had people clinging to ideas of nationalism. You had people um, afraid to really communicate and exchange ideas with, with people who were in conflict with, right, militarily uh, across the world. And the downside of this is that uh, by not working together, by not talking to each other, the rapid pace of technolo technological innovation starts to slow down, um, or at least that's the theory. And from this theory comes the fear that if you don't have the best technology, you are very vulnerable. And specifically in alien movies, invasion films, uh, besides just being technophobic, there really is that technophilic, right? That love of technology that we see. Um, and this movie, more so than any movie we've talked about before, really does try to show you the positives of that technology. Um, the real danger and fear can be seen in the idea that the aliens have a superior technological force in almost every way. Uh, we are completely at a loss upon its first arrival. Um, and ultimately, I'm going to argue that the, all of this kind of is saying that the isolation of us as a people of this planet is something negative that will only lead us uh, to harm and danger, and that what we need is cooperation to foster even more technological development so that we can fight the aliens when they come. OK, questions, comments, concerns before we kick it off? All right, thanks for listening. This is the opening of the movie. Uh, I could have picked any scene, and that really made it difficult to decide a scene to watch for technology. But this way, we get to hear a little bit of REMs. It's the end of the world as we know it. And uh, we get to see that guy from The Mummy hit his head. Um, OK. Uh, I show the opening scene, because not only does it tie back into our conversations about the moon landing, which that's really what this class is secretly about. Um, I'm just trying to get you to see that. That's the first thing they teach you at, in movie school, about the moon landing. Um, but we see uh, a human race surrounded by technology in that, in that lab in New Mexico. Um, and it goes on to show us right, how, how very quick the communication is, is used between the scientific community and the governments of the world. Something uh, we can talk about is technology in this movie. You, we can talk about weapons. We can talk about uh, communication. We can talk about the vehicles. Um, but I also invite you to think about what makes the aliens' technology superior in this movie, right? Why are they such a threat? So I don't know. What do we think? Let's open it up. I can see everybody. Yeah, okay. So I don't know. What does anybody think? Well, it yes, is, sir. I, maybe this is not really mm -hmm. technological superiority, but biologically, they're, they've got the ability to Time use time. us, yeah, use us as tech telepathic ventriloquist dummies, as I like to call it, when they wrap their mm -hmm. tentacles around our necks and they're like, oh, use us as talking because they don't have vocal cords or ears or something. Mm -hmm. They don't yeah. have vocal cords, they don't have mouth. Um, their heads are large and they do show some kind of psionic or psychic abilities. Um, but that is interesting, and you guys can take that and talk about what that means in terms of like advancement of life, if you'd like. Um, but also, uh, this, the, it's a suit, right? Yeah, a bio suit. All right, and that's something in and of itself. Let's go one, two, three. Um, Stefan? I think their shields are also a big thing, because once they get their shields down, it's a, more of a fair fight. So throughout like 90% of the movie, their shields are up, and we can't do anything. Yeah, that, that magic protective bubble, right, of technology. They're surrounded by it and protected by it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, too, that they may be beings that, and maybe because they have such large mm -hmm. heads, that their brains are utilizing more of their brain's capacity, and that gives them, you know, a, they're not as vulnerable because they are able to think on a higher level. And sure. 
Yeah, no, um, and you know, people have all kinds of alien theories, but one theory is like uh, what people think of as UFOs is like, what if that's what people evolve into over thousands and millions of years? You know, like bigger eyes from looking at screens, bigger brains. Uh, uh, Jeff and then Christina. Um, like seeing the clips of this movie again, uh -huh. it really reminds me of a video game. Okay. In the sense where, like, yeah, they're bigger, stronger, their stuff's better, mm -hmm. but not so much better mm -hmm. that where if we don't, like, if we really put our heads to it and, like, really work to figure this out, like, we can't just upset them and knock them down. Like, this is the final boss mm -hmm. of whatever, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. the, like whatever game this is, because, like, it really at the end of the day, it's just like they were like, okay, the shield, boom. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, okay, then we're going to hack them, boom. Like, it was just like one thing after another, and then they were just like, okay, all those little things that make, like, we take away those little advantages that you have, and then, like, we get to shoot you or blow you up. No, and yeah. At the end of the day, like, that's really all it is, like, in, in, in games or whatever. It's just like, yeah, the big boss has extra health, or they have this little pattern that you have to figure out, mm -hmm. and then you figure that out after dying, or in this case, sacrificing a few thousand people. <laughs> yeah. And then you do so. Yeah, that's true. And then you get better. <laughs> Their whole technology, like, uh, it hinges on something that we can undo using, like, a, a Mac 2. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and a computer virus. <laughs> uh, Christina. You could, oh. um, what I was going to say was that, first of all, the opening song, right? It yeah. reminds me, I'm going to take you back because I'm old, right? Okay. <laughs> when that song came out, I was doing a summer program at the College of New Rochelle. I was like in high school or something. And I was learning editing for the first time in my life. It was brand new technology. And I used that song and I cut it to a bunch of environmental things about the earth like being destroyed by us. Mm -hmm. So I hear that song and then you say, well, the, they have protective suits and they have big eyes. And so what comes to my mind is they've destroyed their planet with their technology. Oh. They have nothing left. Mm -hmm. They need a suit because they can't breathe because they have no ozone layer because they've destroyed everything <laughs> given to them, right? Deep. Because of their great technology. Mm -hmm. So right, now... Right. They're out like locusts taking these things from other worlds because they've destroyed all their world with their great technology. And that was just the vision that I had. Yeah, no, that's really good. Uh, there's a big recycling like sub-theme in this movie that if you're paying attention to, you'll see. Um, and yeah, the, the locusts, when the president connects like mentally with one of them, that's how he describes it. And that's like the, the second time we've heard a group of characters in one of these movies get described as locusts. Does any extra points? Does anyone remember the first time we were together? Humans are like Matrix? locusts. Oh, yeah. In the oh, Matrix. Matrix. Yeah. I wasn't there. So yeah, no, it's okay. It's all right. Don't worry. Uh, but yeah, no, and I find that interesting because kind of what you're saying is like maybe this is, when we talk about the other later, right, maybe we'll have more ideas, but maybe the, the aliens in this are like a dark future reflection of where we could go. You know, uh, yes, and then, did you have a hint? No? Okay. It's similar. Uh, I just wanted to also point out that uh -huh. if you just kind of take this as a whole, um, it's pretty much just the reimagining of War of the Worlds. Yes. Exactly. With mm -hmm. modern, the time, technology. Because mm -hmm. you just replace the, our illness and all whatever bacteria or germs with a computer cold virus, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it. Yes, and Jeff Goldblum even dresses like the main character of War of the Worlds. If you go back and watch it, he's wearing like a plaid shirt and he's got these glasses on too. He was the cool scientist. It, that was what War of the Worlds did with the idea of the mad scientist. It made it into like the cool scientist. Um, but something does change when it was in War of the Worlds. Isn't it great that God had the foresight to put these biological bacteria here for us to save us now? Right. But it changes when man makes a computer virus, right? So like in terms of like where the salvation comes from in the two movies, that is where they kind of diverge in terms of like the 50s versus the, the 90s, right? They're, you're starting to see the deus ex machina, right? Like become more like man ex machina. Uh, it's more humanist in yeah. that sense. Yeah, it is much more like secular and humor, uh, humanist. Even though God is, is present in this movie, gets referenced a lot. Mm. 
Uh, other thoughts, yeah? Well, piggybacking on the whole <laughs> difference between the deus ex machina mm -hmm. and the man ex machina, I guess you Because it would be homo ex machina, maybe? But go ahead, yeah, 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 neither here nor there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Latin. Don't, don't question me online. It's okay, it's all right. <laughs> Pater Noster, <laughs> Kies in front channel. It, I guess it kind of makes, this movie kind of makes us look like, might make us think that we're the gods mm. in, of our own, Okay. how we treat things and how we solve problems and all that. Yeah, okay, I think that's a really cool idea to think about as well, right? Like the idea of like creator destroyer, right? Where our salvation comes from. Uh, there isn't a mystical force guiding everything in this movie like in Star Wars A New Hope. Uh, it's it's kind of Jeff Goldblum. That on the spot. <laughs> Although Judd Hirsch's character does have that scene where they all pray, but okay, uh, yes sir. The, the thing I was thinking about earlier was just, you almost mentioned again like in Matrix where they thought of us like we think of them as the locusts that need to come and take over the planet, but I'm sure that in the reverse, they might think of us as locusts. Like, why would we? Like, I don't think anybody that has the ability to fly spaceships through from very yeah. far away, presumably, to here, uh -huh. their consciousnesses have probably evolved over a lot longer period of time and mm -hmm. probably don't consider humans things. Right. Like you're just in the way yeah. because they're not blowing up the planet; they're Ooh, cleaning weeks. up the planet. Yeah. So uh, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Like so I. I'm, I'm, it's interesting that like we movie. think of them like they say we think them of locusts, but they probably think we're the locusts, mm -hmm. and they're just in the way of the the dirty planet. This, this great to planet's them. infested. We got to get rid of these this infestation on it. I like that. We're not even meat. Yeah, yeah. It's not like they want to eat us. Not even meat. And yet, a human life doesn't matter. Just you know. Get out of my way. Mm -hmm. The same way, like uh, a lot of people won't think of like an ant or a spider, you know. Cockroach. Yeah. Cockroach. Very good example. We Sorry to. Go down without a fight. I'm scared. In, in the War of the Worlds, the, the, the more recent people. one with Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, yeah. Weren't they using us as fertilizer? Like, weren't they like splattering us across the landscape? War of the Worlds. <sighs> Something yeah, like that. Like, yeah. I remember like, the big yeah, like, nets. We don't even get, like, we're not even getting this treatment in this. <laughs> like, we are not even That's, fit. To grow their crops with, mm. like that, like that's kind of like that's significant. Like mm -hmm. in the other one, like there was some sort of cycle of life thing happening there, mm -hmm. where like they come here, they're using us as fertilizers, our germs kill them. Mm -hmm. But this is just like just straight up, we're coming here, you have to go, <laughs> and then we figure out a way to get, to get them gone. That's I kind of like it the other way, like, <laughs> not as not as fertilizer, but just oh like wipe us out, you know. <laughs> Subjugate us, not torture us, not. Cause. Yeah. So this is a fear um, that is bounded, that's based in uh, history, right? Uh, can anybody connect to something from history? I mean, you can think of a lot of examples, probably, but this is a fear that's not coming from nowhere. It's a fear uh, in the back. Yeah. So the Industrial Revolution. How so? Well, workers before mechanization were worried about losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. So you've got technology and it's, it's, it's the unknown, so you've got fear of the unknown. Okay. Which I think kind of ties into this because they're coming from another planet, they're unknown to us. Yeah, yeah, and that's really what makes them the other, the outsider uh, in, in any alien movie you're gonna see, right? It's this something that's gonna be so different from us. And if you look at current times, I mean, we're being propaganda or yeah. the mindset is fear of the outside yeah. to take something away from you. Mm -hmm. No, that's really good. And I've, I want to talk about that more later. Uh, other uh, Industrial Revolution, anything else from history that might provide a, a template for this fear American in this film? Revolution. The what? Know the American Revolution, that might seem a little obvious, but... Nothing's obvious unless it's said. Go ahead, tell me why. Uh, well, we're fighting against a, an enemy that might be better than us, like the British, mm -hmm. but uh, we still have the upper hand. Okay. Home field advantage, perhaps, yeah, right? That's a turf, similarity. It's on our turf, so come and get us. Mm -hmm. And luckily, they did choose to invade on July 2nd, which was also when the film was released. So it, it you know, good thing it wasn't Arbor I'm Day. Was July 3rd. The was signed yeah. on the 2nd. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Very good. I'm glad you're paying attention in class. Uh, Stefan? Um, are you talking about like the fear of the invasion kind of thing, or? I don't know what I'm talking about. What do you um, think? I mean, we've had a lot of situations like that. Uh, I guess the Red Scare. Okay. Uh, oh, the they made a Russian spy reference yeah, in that scene we watched. Talk about the Russian. Oh. Um, I mean, that was kind of like 
don't know who to trust. Mm -hmm. Stranger Things season three is, is, is along those lines. I didn't see it yet either. It's just what I've heard. Um, Don't say anything. Yes? I mean, like the whole history of Europe and Asia is just. Let's talk about it. It's just countries that go into a new land because they need more space and they just eliminate everything that's there. Mm -hmm. All the people. I mean, that's what the Mongols did. The, the whole, I mean, like, yeah, the it's whole idea of imperialism. It's a, it's a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty standard, like, history of the United States. It's good history, business. History of the whole world for the last 6,000 mm -hmm. years is just if somebody needs more space, they get it. And they kill them, so it's, it's not an unknown fear, like yeah. in that sense. Right. Not for centuries, yeah. No, they haven't done it recently, but I it's mean, up true. until like about, well, I mean, it, it could be going on right now. It could be. <laughs> uh, one could argue that we're seeing yeah. a, a kind of like a postmodern uh, yeah, imperialism. Like a much nicer version of it. Yeah. It's not like the Mongols like stacking bodies to the ceiling, but. It, okay. It might be getting to that. There's still imperialism. But maybe. I mean, okay. No, I think that's good. And things like that. And like for a long, for a big chunk of history, right? Like it was about a more powerful, more technologically advanced uh, group of people coming and more or less eradicating or subjugating an inferior group of people, and the the, the winners determining who was superior and inferior. But germs played a role. Germs um, still. Right? Now. Like not viewing people as people, but subhuman, right? Was played a role in that historically. So I think that's good, and I think later uh, when we talk specifically about the aliens, I think that will help frame a lot of the, the discussion because there is that historical base for it. Um, I love Dr. Oaken. Um, oh, he's yeah. great. Um, I love to hate him, maybe. I don't know. I don't feel bad for him. Uh, so in the movie, we find out there is an Area 51, and it's... It's been kept secret from us for a very long time, and they've got the, the Roswell crash from the 40s, and they've been trying to figure out this technology since then, and they're working to try to help now. Um, so Dr. Oaken in this movie, if Jeff Goldblum is our cool scientist, uh, Dr. Oaken is definitely our mad scientist, uh, and I'm wondering a little bit about what the mad scientist of the 1990s in this movie is. Uh, how has the concept changed? Because this is not Dr. Frankenstein, despite some similarities. And then why is why does the movie punish or condemn people like Dr. Oaken? Right? Um, and uh, feel free to look. Feel free to use things as, as evidence uh, that aren't on the screen. Uh, okay, let's go here and then there. I've been reading my hand. It's okay. It's fine. Rather than portray him as like a crazy... I mean, he's like the comic relief in this one, rather than more than Doctor Frankenstein. He has something to laugh at. Doc, definitely. Yeah, definitely not like Doctor Shirazawa from Godzilla. Right. Mm hmm Because Jeff Goldblum would fit more in line with that, where Goldblum's like, I have to be the one to go on this mission because I may need to improvise. But go ahead. Yes. So he's somebody to laugh at. Yeah. Right. He's not like Doctor Shirazawa. But He's, what's his crime? What's his sin, right? Why is he someone to laugh at? Because movies do this intentionally. There's a reason we laugh at them. Yeah. Uh, we'll go here and then there. Um, when they first introduce him, uh, and they I, talk I can only about sort of see it. The, uh, the technology that they've been studying and everything. Yeah. He kind of is too much in the numbers and too much in the technology that he loses his empathy. Mm -hmm. And he kind of says, like, how oh, the last few days have been really amazing. And meanwhile, just, yeah. yeah. Uh, He's been really exciting. <laughs> Americans are dying out there. Exciting. So, yeah. And everybody comes in after seeing everybody blown up and dying. It, it just it loses that piece of that humanity that the other characters do have. Okay, let's go here and then there and then this gentleman and then that gentleman. So I, I didn't really even see him as not like as a bad guy or a good guy. Like so what do you see him as? Yeah. More as like the comic relief. Like, okay. I don't, I don't think they portrayed him negatively. Or positively, he was sort of like a plot mover. Like I mean, I, he. I think in the '90s, at least when I saw this in the uh -huh. '90s, I just saw him as like everybody just kind of assumed that there this like in the '90s when I saw this movie, I was in college, and I just assumed there was an Area 51, and there are guys like him doing this. Yeah, I just assumed that was the way it is, and I, I think like when I watched this the first time, I was like, yeah, I, I assume there's a mad scientist who's probably a little crazy. Yeah, he's probably working on this stuff. He probably has no connection to the real world because I'm sure he's isolated because he's uh -huh. not allowed yeah. to go outside. And then and he says that they don't let us out much in the movie. He says that, yeah, or, or, or they like you know they don't let you know what the other guy's working on. Uh -huh. According to the recent podcast that I've been listening okay. to. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, uh, this guy, uh, Doctor Oak. That's so, interesting though because all of the comic relief gets murdered, right? If you think about David's well, boss, yeah. I gotta call my mother. 
and you think about him, and you think about Steve's friend, um, the pilot. Jimmy. Yeah, Jimmy. Uh, oh, yeah. The, those comic relief characters are the cannon fodder or in the sure. first act of this film. Yeah. It's a um, movie. And I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to think about like, what is it? Why does the movie kill all of the comic relief like that? Something to consider. I thought it was funny. No, I think it is funny <laughs> because I'll, I'll say that if if the sequel hadn't come out, this guy's dead, right? I understand in the sequel he's alive, but this movie they check his pulse. The guy lets go, like. It is implied that this man is dead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Neither here nor there. You yeah. had your hand? Yeah. You, sir. Question. Derek? Um, getting off the topic of him being more of a comic relief. OK, what do you think? Yeah. Let's go back to one of, your, one of the first points you brought up about uh, uh, first theme of first theme that you brought up about the movie, which is segregation of you know, all the different things. You know, everyone is, is keeping to themselves and they don't want to share information mm -hmm. and that, that separation of all. He is the personification of, of that same concept by, you know, the, the smartest, you know, all, all these government people think that he's the smartest guy in the room until Jeff Goldblum shows up. Mm -hmm. So the smartest guy- Cable repairman. Right. Uh, the smartest guy you think is in the room, not. Yeah. It's the, Cable repairman pulling up his cell phone and finding where his ex-wife is and things mm -hmm. you know, whatever. So there's that that you know, if we're going with that theme, here's that, like I said, that personification of that and yeah. it's being represented here. And then you have all the common belief stuff and everything, but it's interesting to see very much that he's not the smartest guy. Yeah, and like if you look at the the, the moving images on the bottom, right? He doesn't know the names of anything. And, and David Levinson sits down and he's like, well, this does this and this does that. And he's like, oh, you're making us look bad. Um, because he's able to figure out, you know, in two days what these guys have been taking 50 years to get nowhere with, really. Um, I think over here there was a hand. Yeah. yeah. And then we'll go right here. Um, I thought that these guys were portrayed negatively. Uh huh. Kind of, sort of, because they weren't, they weren't really so much out to s try to save the world. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, so much as just, not, I mean, not even survive, just, like, just validate, yeah, just validate what they've been spending their whole lives doing. Mm -hmm. It's just like they, you know, they, they had gone so long, like, yeah, you know, like, imagine, you know, you, you, you go through high school and you go through college studying, like, the possibilities of what's out there in the world, and then you get a job basically just, like, shooting, enough, like, beams of Norse code into space, mm -hmm. praying you bounce something off. And just, like, everybody's kind of like, yeah, okay, all right, like, there's this guy, and then, like, when it finally happens, like, he's hyped because, like, he's, like, he, look at him, he's giddy. He is giddy, yeah. Like, he's just, like, <laughs> like he's just like, yes, they're here. And everybody's just kind of like, why are you so excited? Like, mm -hmm. we're all going to die. And he's like, yeah, but I was right. Mm -hmm. I did the, like, I'm, I'm the re Like, he probably thinks, like, his signal called them down. Or yeah. whatever, like, you know what I mean? He's just like, I'm the re Like, it's all great. <laughs> like, so when he gets choked out and yeah. slammed up against the wall, and the alien speaking through him, it's just like, yes, this is what you deserve. Mm -hmm. This is what you always wanted. You wanted that close encounter. Here's the closest encounter you're ever gonna get, buddy. Yeah. Like, and it, like you said, like if they didn't do that, you know, cash grab sequel, mm -hmm. that's oh. how he would have died. Yeah. <laughs> You've been asleep for 20 years. Yeah, that's conveniently. it. Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, worth it just to see him die. But it, it's, uh, I like what you're saying because it's almost like he doesn't see the danger of this. No. The danger of finding out we're not alone in the universe, right? There, there's a lot of. He's just really happy like, about it, excited. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There are some people who are drawn to it, though. Yeah. And, and not only that, but it, I kind of look at it a little bit as a kind of like an ident identity thing. Sure. You know, we all have to have these, know who we are, what we're doing, what our purpose is, and kind of like, that's the excitement of it all. Mm -hmm. And his purpose is about understanding the creatures, not right. necessarily about saving the world. Okay, here and then, and then in the back. Um, Obviously, this is 23 years ago, but I think he's a representation clearly of how people view America. Okay. I think he's just a babbling idiot, probably. especially this gif here. Oh, these configurations. Uh, we yeah. don't know what the hell this crap is. Like, I think people look at us, um, you know, we think, we think we're 
more educated and more intelligent and more, you know, this, that, and the third. But I think what other people see is just people who have no humility, mm -hmm. um, no ability to kind of receive things from others. Um, and that's ultimately, I think, why the character dies, too, because that, that will kill you. Yeah. yeah. So I, th I think he's just a representation of America in this film. Sure, there's some intellectual elitism, right, right exactly. that comes with his character. Yeah. All right, so let's go back there and then right here. Well, why are we... And then I want to change mean, the slide. He's go ahead. giddy about it, but yeah. so are a whole bunch of other dumb people that are up on roofs mm -hmm. about to get blown up. That's right, they and get blown up too. Like, they're opening <laughs> up! Like, let's not forget that whole big scene of... Well, we laugh at them because we're like, die, dumb you-know-whats. Because like, yeah. <laughs> that's what our brains say. Like, that's not where I'd be, you know, but... There is this whole sect of people, like cult-like, mm -hmm. you know, that welcome yeah. death right. and That's in this kind of country. Mm -hmm. And if you think that doesn't Sick. symbolize, you know, the middle class being burnt on the tops of roofs and their dumbass kids being like, burn us, it totally does. Yeah. In my yeah. opinion. Uh, because you don't, and if you look at the kind of people also that are there, you know, they have like a certain, like you're going to find them... I didn't ask. You know, it yeah. would be absurd with <laughs> their loafers on or something. You know, like they make it into a certain sect of people. You don't see all kinds of denominations up there on the roofs. You know, mm -hmm. it's like these kind of people, and this is okay. I think it's a whole different. Like, I, I'd rather stand and and die. You know, there's uh, there's but the, they were excited about it, and that's that's the giddiness. That there's the mean. Futurama meme. Maybe you've seen it, where it's the the professor from that show, and he's like, I don't want to live on this planet anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's like people like that, where they're like, I, I don't, I, something better has come. Um, so I like that. Let's go, let's go here, and so then we'll change. So the piggyback on what Kate said, the how we are viewed. I also thought mm -hmm. that this kind of showed complacency in advancement of technology and science. Yeah. I think Oaken in, in some way also showed that uh, people who have the access and power to these things to make it better mm -hmm. kind of just sit and let everything just be the way it is without actually really doing something about sure. it. Um, that's what I got. And of course, the comic relief in that was supposed to play like, like a joke, like, yeah, you know, we... we I, we can really do this. We can really make it better as far as our weapons and, and the science to understand these things. But, you know, we we, we don't get out much. We kind of just, we do what we do. And that's, it kind of just how people just stay stagnant in certain aspects of their life. And in this case, science, mm -hmm. where there's, where's the improvement? Where It took one guy to come in and show them everything that they could be doing, but they never did. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Uh, let's talk about fear and courage, because speaking of uh, people who don't see the the danger in the situation, uh, is this is Jimmy. Yeah, oh, Jimmy's yes, my, Jimmy. my favorite dumb character. All right, we're running behind, so I want to make sure we we got it. So you, they go, they shoot at the aliens. They don't work. They got force fields. We've covered that already. Yeah. Um, so characters are kind of stereotypical. I think we've touched upon this a little bit. Uh, a lot of stereotypes and flat characters in play in this movie. Uh, half of them are really brave, and half of them are, are cowardice, or, or dumb, or too afraid. Um, and I want us to think a little bit about that. Uh, think a little bit about that in terms of the characters. Um, so let's talk about who's brave, let's talk about who's not brave, and then let's think about what the movie is, is saying based on that. Um, so what do we think about characters? Uh, go ahead. That guy who says, sorry. No, go ahead. That's not entirely accurate. Mm -hmm. He knew sort of about the whole Area 51 thing. Yeah, he, he did. He held back on it. Mm -hmm. So. Coward. Yeah, definitely a coward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody people. disagree? Yeah, I think I think he's kind of presented really, really as like shrivel, make, sniveling. Yeah, really hard to make withholding information a grave act. Yeah. Knows. Yeah. No, especially if it, it could have saved lives in the cities when the cities are being destroyed. But these people were trained to follow chain of command and protocol. Uh huh. The Secretary of Defense you're talking about. Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay. Under treason. Sure. Yeah. So it's not like, hey, I should just open my mouth right now. So I wouldn't really like say he was I agree. cowardice. Okay. Um, I think he was strong to his suit. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a very, and that goes to show you, like, 
you know, do, do you follow all the lemmings off the, the, right. you know, the top of the, the thing? So, um, but in terms of courageous, I mean, I kind of see myself, um, the stripper mom, as okay. being very courageous. Jasmine. Yeah, Jasmine. Sorry, I was weird her name. But I, I She's like more than her job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she has two full-time jobs. Yeah, she has comma. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Thank you, Stefan. I appreciate punctuation. The punctuation. <laughs> Um, I actually find her very courageous because I think that she's a big undertone, but mm -hmm. she's a single mom, she drags that boy out, and she's going to find her man, and mm -hmm. she's going to go through whatever she got to do, she got to save the president, she got to find the president's wife, if she got to ride a dead horse, she's going to do it, mm -hmm. and she's going to get there on the Old Town Road, you know, and that's it, <laughs> that, that's her deal, um, and I found her to actually be the most courageous because she didn't have an army behind her, she didn't have training, she only had her mm -hmm. and her son out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, no, I take back what I said about everybody being stereotyped. She's probably the roundest character in the movie. Yeah. Right? Like, the stripper character is probably the most, like, well-rounded of the characters. Uh, yes, Jamie. I think a word that you missed out on was uh, naive. Naive. The most naive character. Okay, yeah. Um, and I think that that changes in the, in the middle of the film, but I, it is very striking to me how naive Will Smith's character uh -huh. is at the beginning of this movie because oblivious he's, he's yeah. completely oblivious i mean there's a there's a, a ufo in the sky uh -huh. and he and he's like everything's gonna be fine they're just, why would they come all this way to to, to blow start us some up stuff, yeah. and, and he and he leaves he leaves his his partner and his and his stepchild they're at the house instead of being like, hey, let's go to the naval base together. Mm -hmm. That is very naive. I can't imagine that anybody would actually do that in that situation. Um, and, you know, it, it kind of seems to me like everybody in the top chain of command is completely naive to this entire... Okay. Like, where's the one person that's like, these guys are going to blow us up? Except for this guy who just wants to nuke them right off the bat. <laughs> right, and he's the only right person. <laughs> okay. I like that. That's well, a different no, perspective. Crazy, I wasn't expecting it. The crazy guy wanted to nuke them from the beginning. And he wasn't naive because he's, he's the This I guy? Mean, he's, no. <laughs> he's the smartest person. Russell ever. Case? And Russell the Case? hero. The, the crop farm. The yeah. crop farm. He's on a redemptive arc in the movie, definitely. He's a character who's got to overcome alcoholism and redeem himself. We'll go one, two, three. Well, that's that's exactly what I was going to say. If if we're going to pick the bravest guy or the bravest character, mm -hmm. it definitely wouldn't be. Will Smith annoyed the hell out of me through this entire yes. punched an alien. Entire though. film, man. He punched an alien in the face. And he, and he welcomed I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's just, he, he annoyed me. He ended up, he seemed naive. He seemed like this was going to be that easy to, to beat mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> aliens. But <laughs> Randy Quaid, to me, was the bravest, most... I really miss Randy Quaid. He, he was great. He was, he was the bravest dude in the whole movie. He saved, mm -hmm. basically, everybody by sacrificing himself and leaving his kids behind. Mm. Um, and no one believed him. He was the guy that everyone thought was the town kook, and everybody thought he was the guy who, oh, you're just, whatever, you're just telling old war stories, and no one believes you. But yet, was the only guy in the film that really showed that he would sacrifice everything for his country, or yeah. for his, his kids. That, that, like that, the run, uh, that scene against the, the ships at the end, right, really does re remind me of the run on the Death Star in A New Hope, and uh, Russell Case, right, Randy Quaid's character, takes it one step further than Luke Skywalker did, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, turn off the targeting computer, Luke, now, like, fly yourself into the Death Star, <laughs> right? Like, so we're, we're seeing, like, a level of self-sacrifice like, that we haven't seen, uh, yeah. and you could say, I guess, Neo in the Matrix movies, maybe, right? But, like, that, and I think that definitely could tie in with the, like, the patriotism and the, and the stuff oh, yeah. about the, around that in the movie. So we're gonna go here and then there. I think also going back to this guy on the bottom, um, yes, he probably had to, you know, live true to the facade of, mm -hmm. you know, but I think if you look throughout history and through things, like, there's always that one person who has way more information than they should have, or, excuse me, way more information that they should actually use. Like, if you look at the Titanic, they knew it was going to happen, mm -hmm. right? And they chose to do nothing. Yeah. So I think it shows also with technology, we don't use <clears throat> what we have efficiently. Um, or we don't do anything about it, and it could have been probably prevented. I mean, I don't know how you prevent aliens from coming down, but um, they probably could have handled it a little bit differently. Yeah. Um, there is uh, the idea, we talked in earlier about communication being made so much uh, more available because of technology around the world, and it's almost as though like the bureaucracy right. 
right, is what bogs down and hinders that communication amongst people. We're going to go here? Yeah, uh, I would like to stand up for Jimmy. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay, go ahead. Jimmy, I mean, I, I think he's funny. Go ahead. In case you did not know, Jimmy is Jimmy. an ace pilot. Yeah. Okay? Jimmy is in the 99% in his field, right? Mm -hmm. Jimmy gets into a whatever ton, how many tons that thing is measured in. Takes the mask off. War machine and then flies it however many Gs yeah. and shoots things out of the sky. You ever seen Space Jam? Have Space Jam was about Space aliens yeah. coming to play basketball mm -hmm. against the 99th percentile of guys who play basketball. Against Michael Jordan and against, Bill Murray. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like when, where this comparison's going. When Michael Jordan, when, when, when they went to Michael Jordan, they were, they were like, yo, these aliens have come here to play basketball against you. Michael Jordan didn't go, well, damn, they're aliens. He said, Oh, this is basketball? Mm. That's great. <laughs> when they came in planes, mm -hmm. Jimmy was like, bet, they're in planes. I destroy planes. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. So, yeah. <laughs> Hero. <laughs> Hero. That's what <laughs> heroes do. Yeah. 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 Jimmy. Go um, Jimmy. Ex <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, listen. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna speak ill of the dead either because you know he's a, he's an American hero. All right, I won't argue with that. But he, this is the 99th percentile, top of his class, best of the best, brightest, and he freaks out and takes his mask off and you know blows himself up. And I don't know. I, I mean, I don't want to be too hard on him, but uh, the the film. When you fly your plane, yeah. do you take your mask off? No, I never take my mask off. They can't hear you in the other planes. You don't get the oxygen. It's thin up there. Um, he was, he's anti-stripper, he's anti-stripper wife, he says, you know, they're never going to send him to space if you marry a stripper. That's true. Uh, so maybe it's that, maybe it's that bias he has against, you know, working women, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Never so happened like, in 2019. So this is like a weird stretch, but... <laughs> steer it, yeah. Like, this is a, a weird stretch Go for, for it. fear, but... So one of the big themes of this is that we're not prepared for an alien invasion. Yeah. As most people don't believe in aliens, and certainly if you were to, like, be a public figure, or in any sort of public sphere, if you start talking about like, I mean, it's starting to come out now, mm -hmm. but people think that probably the greatest, everybody has a lot of threats to the planet, <coughs> environmental concerns and whatever, but the biggest threat might be like an asteroid destroying the, the planet. Okay. That's aside from, or an alien, but aliens are probably less likely than just an asteroid since we're in an asteroid or field. Bomb. Yeah. And there's, it, it, there's a fear of coming out and saying that should be the biggest problem, like politically, like socially, like with your friends, like I don't know, most people don't go into parties and talk about how they believe in aliens and that should be the primary focus of our governments. Yeah. This fear Get some looks. leaves yeah. like <laughs> the planet at risk for exposure to the outside. I mean, right. you know, how much effort do we spend like defending ourselves from each other, but nobody spends any money defending from an asteroid that could instantly end the planet in like a button. You, mm -hmm. you wouldn't see it. I mean, they made a movie about it. It was pretty depressing. Deep Impact or Armageddon? No, no. Oh. with an M. <laughs> Melancholia. Melancholia. Oh, that's what the moon was going to hit the Earth. That's right. sad. Yeah. That's like, it, just, it like, wasn't that's a moon, it was a planet. It was, oh, it's just nowhere. another planet? It just came okay. out of nowhere and ended the planet. That was the end. And like, <laughs> that's, and this is roughly similar. I mean, it's aliens is the same as like an asteroid. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, something coming from the outside. And there's a fear to even bring it up as a topic because it's so, because science fiction makes it kind of like you're a nerd. Yeah. And therefore, you, sh you can't. There's like a fear of repressing it, and that's what ends up for at least the first half of this movie, or nobody's prepared. Mm -hmm. Like nobody has any idea what they should be doing at this point. They're like scrapping along the entire time rather than, you know, being ready for an alien invasion. Yeah. Which they wouldn't be if they weren't afraid to talk about it and work on it since 1947. But how like, could you prepare? Don't be afraid to talk about aliens. Well, they could have been crowdsourcing it. Like yeah. like the alien, the, the, the alien doctor, knows. the crazy guy, yeah. wasn't allowed to talk to anybody because right. nobody's allowed to discuss this in public mm -hmm. because nobody's Multiple allowed to speak about this. You're, you're afraid yeah. the Russians are going to find out about it's, your secret technology. There's a lot of fear going around that prevents anybody from mm -hmm. doing anything. Nationalism, right? Yeah. We've seen it's what happens in Stranger the Things. Crippling. Sure. Yeah, I think that just if they had, if there's no fear to discussing aliens openly yeah. in 1947, right? Then by 1994, people might have I don't know thought about how you would defeat an alien invasion as opposed to waiting for them to show up at the moon and like signaling their destruction code. 
Okay. Which it's, is a little late. A little late, yeah. It's to like develop the, star lasers. It's the counter to the government's, or at least like one of every government's biggest, like, stances, right? It's like, we keep you guys from panicking. Like, mm -hmm. we withhold information because if, God forbid, if you guys knew, yeah. you guys would murder <laughs> each other. Us. Like, we swear to God. Yeah. Like, if you guys knew what was really out there, you guys would kill each other for <laughs> cans of beans. So thank us. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy Lee Jones in Men in Black, a year after this, says a person is smart. People are stupid and uh, paranoid and right, afraid. Yeah. And uh, that's the, the argument against telling them. There's some evil spaceship mm -hmm. in Men in Black. Right, there's always a threat. Some Cyrillian death ray or mm -hmm. whatever you call it. And the only way that we, as a society, can get on with our lives is if we don't know about it or we just use one of those little neuralizer thingamahoos and... <laughs> Wasn't Will Smith well, Agent J? Agent J. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the extended universe. Uh, show of hands, you think we're better off not knowing? Never. I mean, I saw this movie, Never. so I know what happens if we're not prepared. Not All right, I don't know. It's only thing about So better <laughs> like to us so. on, like, <laughs> well, we, should, we, we should make ben allies, not What's the enemies. budget? That's good. Is this the red pill, blue pill again? Almost. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and then I'm going to change the slide. Go ahead. Well, All of China. the main argument has been about this type of alien movie where, like, the aliens, um, like, try to kill us all. Is like, why... Is so most that, alien movies. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Like, <laughs> most likely aliens, if they come all this way, either it'll be for resources like in this, mm -hmm. or it'll be that they're just as curious about us as we are about yes, them. Yes, that's a positive. Okay. Hey, I was trying to think of an alien movie where the aliens don't come to kill us, I guess yes. E.T.? Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, even better. They Arrival, treat us like maybe, we're yeah. dumb Alf? and backwards. No, we try to kill Alf, he ate all the cats. I don't know. Close Encounters? Close Encounters, yeah, oh, that's yeah. true. Conan's. Earth Girls are yeah. easy. Yeah. So, uh, District 9, yo, that's District true. Okay. Nine. All right, you convinced me. Morgan Mindy. Morgan Mindy. Rob Williams did not come to kill us. I said that, and he said he ate the cats. Michael, well, no, no. I mean, we eat chickens. We eat chickens. We eat chickens. That's one of the yeah. worst, like, most but adult moments definitely. in a kid's movie ever. Okay. I hardly noticed. Yeah, uh, what the last Mimsy. <laughs> oh, that's I'm, terrible. I'm going to win that. Okay. okay. Uh, no, no. Uh, Michael Remy and. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm Rocky Horror. And Michael no, Michael don't worry. It's, 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 it's Michael Remy in his silver underwear uh, with the robot sword or whatever. That's not, uh, oh, um, yeah. I just yeah, thought it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, not man. Not the remake. With Keanu. Good, good. <laughs> not the remake. Not Neo Claw 2. Okay. All right, okay, all right. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, last thought before we, we look at love. The last look at love. Love? There's nothing like that. What's love yeah. got to do with it? Love's got a lot to do with it. <laughs> How um, good. Yeah, love. Just like I think The Matrix is about robots learning to love, um, love is a really important thing in uh, this movie. I would argue most science fiction movies, uh, it is often uh, portrayed to have some kind of redemptive power, right? That love can save the day or make things better. Uh, uh, Julius? Um, what's Julius uh, Levinson? Yeah. He says, uh, all you need is love. John Lennon, smart man. I Somebody shot Ewan him. Ewan McGregor said that? Ewan McGregor said it also, but he was quoting this guy. I swear. <laughs> all right, some love stuff. Just tell him I hit you. All right. Uh, Okay, again, take a time. Uh, so, uh, left over from that clip was them, uh, Steve and Jasmine getting married in the chapel. Uh, and then you see David and... Con Connie. Connie? Okay, all right, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Connie, uh, like, hold hands in that scene. So that's, that's what... what she notices that he's still wearing his mm -hmm. wedding ring. Though, still wearing mentioned. the ring. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we've got, this is an ensemble cast. We've got three main leads. They are President Thomas Whitmore, uh, Colonel Steve, uh, Captain Stephen Hillard, and uh, cable technician David uh, Levinson. Uh, and each of these gentlemen are paired with a, a lady in the movie and have some kind of relationship uh, dynamic uh, operating in the plot. And of these three characters, two of them end up with happy endings, and one of them ends pretty tragically. So. Something I'd like you to consider is um, how does love play a role in this film, but also why does 
Mrs. Widmore uh, perish right, in the movie? Uh, why uh, does that relationship go that way? Um, and what changes in the other two gentlemen's relationships that allow them for this happy ending in the movie? And what's that saying? Uh, yes, and then we'll go there. So if you're starting at the beginning of the movie to, I guess, to answer the question. Go ahead. Jeff Goldblum's love mm -hmm. saves the president. Mm -hmm. And you need the president to save the world. You need the president somehow to get Will Smith. But Jeff Goldblum is able to connect with his ex-wife. Mm -hmm. Somehow, this TV guy mm -hmm. has decoded a signal, mm -hmm. calls his ex-wife, who works for the president, and is able to get to the president. What if he wasn't? What if he had not had this relationship with this woman that worked well, in government? What would have happened? Right. Who would have broken the? Who would have cracked the code? No, that's it's, a good it's, question. It's, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We wouldn't be having know. this conversation. Everyone would just be dead. Um, right, Jeff Goldblum. And then we it's wouldn't true. have a movie. Can I? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Can I? Um. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. I think one part of that dynamic is that it's sort of that what if. Uh -huh. Because he's clearly brilliant. She's, Jeff clear, yeah. she's clearly brilliant. And, you know, she's like, uh, you know, like, and I guess part of that is like the whole gender dynamics too is like she really wants to take advantage of all the talent that she has. And, like, he is a man, he's able to just take advantage of that privilege. Just like, yeah, you know, I just like, I. I don't care what I'm doing, like, mm -hmm. as long as I'm with you, like, this brilliant, beautiful, amazing woman, and she's just like, bruh, like, I want to take over the world, like, you can take over the world, too, Who that's Jeff why I was with you in the first place, yeah. like, he, de yeah, like, he decodes, like, he puts his mind in something and he saves the freaking planet, yeah. and she's just like, and that's why she's like, haven't you ever wanted to be a part of something special, mm -hmm. and like, they're just two on two different wavelengths where he's looking, like, and the reason why that is is because he sees her as, like, this perfect person, sure. and she's like, yeah, like, you're great, but we can both do this thing together, like, we can rule the world, we can mm -hmm. both save the planet and like i'm going to do that with or without you and he's just like i just want to be with you and she's like yeah well that's not enough and before the chapel scene right she's like why you why do you have to go david why does it have to be you to go into space and he says well you know it's uh, you're always saying i want to change the world save the world uh, so yeah, it's almost as though he becomes that thing she was looking for. Yeah, like right? he, he finally figured it out. He's like, he's like, the reason why I don't have her is because I haven't been doing yeah. stuff like this in the first place. So now I have to do this. Okay. Other hands? I saw some over here. No? Greg? I was just going to say that you know, there's three different love stories going on. There are. And it's, uh, you said there's three main leads or three like sort of plot lines with yeah. couples. And love yeah. just sort of acts like a glue in this movie. I mean, just from a movie standpoint, love. Okay. it intertwines with all their motivations to do small acts, which when combined result in like, I mean, Jeff Goldblum doesn't save the planet. He starts saving the planet. Right. Mm -hmm. Then the next person has to make yes. like a certain flight and that has to happen. And then another person has to do something and all the decisions require some <laughs> little motivation. Yeah. And love sort of is like a thread that kind of pulls all the Good motivations. Job, so they're just sort of showing it as like a common. Yeah, you need this marriage between science and military. Yeah, like you, you can't ever just have government. purely, you know, unmotivated characters just solving things because there's right. no real reason to be solving anything if you don't have some motivation. Like, why yeah. is Will Smith here? He's here because, like, of a relationship. Why is this person at this location at this particular time? Like, it's just sort of a background glue to the whole mm -hmm. concept of us. Moving on. It's a lot of their motivations uh, in terms, right? A lot of what they do is in response to the people they love, trying to protect them or find them or save them. It, it's woven into the movie well. Yeah. So yeah. that it doesn't like take over any part. It's not like overly dramatic in any one scene because they don't. <coughs> it's like five minutes of love story per, mm -hmm. per character. Yeah. But over the course, like it's enough to pull all the characters into the right spot so that it could be a theme in the movie without actually sucking up time from... Yeah, because everybody starts scattered up. all over the place in the movie, and the movie pulls everybody together so that then those right. three different fronts the, the, the aliens can be fought on. Uh, yeah. I have to go back to the stripper again. Okay. <laughs> you would. Go ahead, Christina. I feel like, I mean, she's stripping because she loves her kid. 
She's not like a dirty woman who like wants to be raunchy. You know? She's like an upstanding woman that takes yeah. her clothes off and yeah. does what she does because yeah. she loves her kid. Yeah. And that's her option to take care of him. So I think the love starts from the first scene of her on that floor and what she's going through backstage and the nasty men trying to take her home and all mm -hmm. the other things that go on there. But her leaving to get home to her son. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the purest of the love. And that's what I see the love first, right? So she's like a microcosm of the big thing. Like, okay, so this is all the sacrifice that we do in our daily lives for real, mm -hmm. for the people that we love. We would give up everything, our clothes, everything, yeah. our dignity for the people we love, right? Sure. And then in the bigger scale, you have, you know, the non-reality, bigger thing with the same things happening. But she is actually the reality. Yeah. She's the everyday person. She's the thing you need to look at in this. She's the person with the strength in my, like, that's what I always saw through this. Like, she always came back with the strength. She was like, you know, fighting her way through tooth and nail. She outran a huge explosion and, and well, saved the dog. I mean, she saw that coming. She was like, I don't know why you all are out here, but we, we need to go. Okay. You know? But the other love story that I see that we also didn't talk about, which I think are the two biggest love stories. Can you talk about Forget, Russell? Like, the BS is the father-son love. Yeah. Okay, so there's the mother-son love, and then there's the father-son love. Yes. For Will okay. Smith's character and the little no, boy? Jeff what are you talking about? No, oh, and his, his father, yeah, okay. They have mm -hmm. a very conflicted it's relationship. It's my David, yeah. Yeah, and the love that transpires through them, again, this small microcosm of what really happens in people's lives and people's families, what they go through, the struggles every day, and then showing it as like, we could show it as this big explosion of the world pulling down, or mm -hmm. we can show you what people really go through and break them. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's those two threads to me are the real story yeah. behind the explosion. But you, you could know? say the same for Randy Quaid's character, right? Because that final act, right, in the movie is him, him too. You're looking right. at him his, and children's his children's picture, tell my children I love them. Your we father was a brave man. Such a mess up. I'm sorry. Yeah. You're yeah. right. He shouldn't come above the stripper. The drunk too. Right, the, the drunk, drunk too. redneck. You know, um, cousin Eddie. Respect cousin drunk, Eddie. Respect the yeah. Respect the drunk and strippers. Drunk. Like but like, it is those people, like um, the outliers in our society, the the undesirables in our society that are propped up as heroes in this film as well, as an addition to the the, the military traditional the hero. They show to have the heart. Yeah. You see, that's the, that's the thing. They, they mm -hmm. have the real heart. Yeah, because they know? haven't been conditioned okay. to serve. They just do. They just do it. It's not because they have to, right? right? OK, let's go here and then there, and then we're going to change the slide. I think the other thing is also with it. a lot of these, uh, this genre, the, the disaster movies, and even like just these really bigger action set piece kind of movies, there always needs to be that, like, all right, everybody's getting killed or things are blowing up, and there always has to have, like you said, that glue that holds everything together. And it's more um, besides just kind of pulling people together and, and helping the plot points move, I think it also shows what they're fighting for mm. and the reason to bother, like, why even bother having to like, fight back and do this thing? It's because of these relationships, it's because of the love. Okay. Uh, here and then there. Uh, one other love that is not discussed in the slide is love of country. Mm -hmm. This movie is called Independence Day. I got a patriotism slide coming up. Oh, Don't good. Worry. We can discuss it then. But yeah, I mean, all these main characters in this film are working for the government. Even Jeff Goldblum, he works for television news. Mm -hmm. That that is something. The man. Yeah, the man. And you know, man. every movie we watch here. Um, but it, you have all these people that are working for the country and working for the government. I mean, this movie does not take place in Russia, who, and they're also dealing with the same thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take place in Tokyo. It's taking place in America, and all these people are working together to defend their country. I don't know if that makes them love their country or love the person next to them or their child, but there is... Maybe it's both. Maybe it, right. it, it is both, and maybe we can get to that in the Patreon. All right, let's go here, here. yeah. I was just thinking that sometimes love is also not just between two people, but mm -hmm. when one person and it becomes contagious has a passion for something yeah. that mm -hmm. is that they love, and sometimes they feel torn. It's like competes with the love of the person that's also involved. Mm -hmm. So there's like these, you know, things that just when you feel called to a certain mission, it's like that's the most important thing sometimes and that you choose and then 
Yeah, so and you see that. Later, later, so you may regret it later, and lose. And a lot of times, people lose their whole the whole point and why they were doing it in the first place. Because mm -hmm. of, of all the well, you see that with with Connie's character having to make the choice right between her yeah. career and her husband. You see it with. Uh, Will Smith's character, Steve, uh, where Jasmine doesn't want him to leave, and he's like, I've got to go do this. I'm doing this for you. You know? That conflict definitely runs, you know, where do your allegiances lie? What comes first for you as a character? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last thought, and then I'm changing slides. No, no, I'll save it for the next, for the patriotism. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about the other, and then talk about patriotism and peace, and we will make some conclusions. So here's an alien autopsy scene. Yes. Oh, no. Nope. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Never Let's try again. Uh, All right. Yeah. Aliens in this movie. Aliens in any movie. They're the other. They're the unknown. But that is not something that is just uh, left to describe aliens, right? Uh, in many. Uh, genres or film or books, right? It's the idea of the outsider, the idea of the the thing that is different or the people or person that is different. And uh, the aliens are our monster and they are devoid of humanity and sympathy in this movie. They are so far removed from us. And that is something to be afraid of. And I want you to think about the aliens' motivations. So we talked a little bit about locusts consuming resources. I want you to consider that again, but also think about uh, the world that we live in and parallels symbolically that we may be able to make connections to with movies about aliens. Uh, so let's go here and then there. For me, the first time I watched this and it was like the big thing and it was so little coming mm -hmm. out of like, you know, and oh, it's not that much different than us because the whole time we think it's this big thing. We don't realize it's like this whole suiting. You yeah. know, we think it's this crazy looking alien like you would think it would be. But really, when you look at it, it looks kind of meek, mm -hmm. you know, and goopy and cute. not very um, pr protected, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think, especially with what's going on in our world now, I don't know if that had so much to do with them, but I think a big theme of this country itself sure. is immigration. Okay. So, like, what? what is an alien? <laughs> what do we call... Well, listen, my family emigrated here, mm -hmm. you know, we're Italian, I'm first generation. So they all left, you know, World War II, you know, more Mussolini situation to come here. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we say? Illegal alien, right? Mm -hmm. So why do we say alien? Why? Because they look different, right? But what yeah. do we look like here? We're not sure. Mm -hmm. And every time a big wave of people come from a country, they're all alienated, no matter what they are here most of the time. And then they assimilate, and then we have a new group of people to... Alienate, you know, okay. and that's why we use the word alienate yeah. and alien and illegal alien. So to me, a lot of this was about, and you know, they give you the clips of the other countries at the end. They do, you know? yeah. But we're the ones that figured it out, mm -hmm. and we are telling every other country, you know, because we're the big man at the top, we're always the best, but we're not. And this is the illusion of our country, you know. Okay. We're better than anyone else, and no matter how every other country does it, we're going to be the ones to save every country, you know. So I think that was a big theme through it. And a lot that I saw, you know, was like the history of how this world settled here. Mm -hmm. And what did we do? We came and murdered all the people that lived here and stole their land from them. Right? Yeah. Um, and then other people that want to come here and do the same thing, not even steal land, you know, like actually earn it and work on the land and migrate around the land, we call them an illegal alien. Um, yeah. So I think it says a lot to who we are in this country. And as someone whose family only came here without any of these pretenses, like I had nothing to do with slavery, I had nothing to do with any of this stuff that happened in this country. I have my own crap in Italy, you know. But okay. here in this country, I can feel like I can look back and be like, watch the waves that happened yeah. and how from the beginning we took this country from people that were here by coming. Why? Because they were happy with what they had. They could use their land. But we had used all of our own stuff, so we wanted to come and get more land and more freedoms, and we're going to murder all the people and stuff that's here in their way and take it over like locusts. We came from Europe. Mm -hmm. We came from other areas, right, to take over this land that was native to the people that lived there very simply. So to me, what is America? The alien invasion. We were it how many years ago, you know, with Manifest Destiny. 
So okay. that was my whole big takeaway okay. of what this movie meant. Yeah, no, and often, right, anti-immigration propaganda will work to dehumanize the group, right? Uh, you know, they're monstrous. They're coming. They're going to take your jobs, your women, your they children. They don't speak your, your language. Homes. They don't understand they don't speak you. You can't language. communicate mm -hmm. with them. You know, all these things, how they couldn't speak with them. and They bring drugs and alcohol, whatever it is. Right, and uh, yeah, it's that the the power structure here, right, came and did and you know and co-opted, took uh, land and resources from a group that was here, and since that point, there's been fear, right, that others will do the same, right, uh, and that is a very infectious fear, right. Talk about the Red Scare earlier, right? Like that was another wave of fear of the outsider, fear of the other. Communism is really different from capitalism, and they're, in, in Soviet Russia, car drives you, right? Like, they're so different from us. Uh, and that is, in most alien movies, uh, including District 9, but maybe not ALF, um, <laughs> but it is that, right? Like, that often when we are talking about aliens, right, in movies as a monster, right, you can see symbolic parallels to immigration, sure. You know, and the outsider's there. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, that's, I mean, yes, the, there's a lot of that in this, but when yeah. you say you have one of the questions up there is, are the aliens' motivations really a secret? I mean, at some point, he just says, no, we're just here to kill you all. Right. I mean, he actually says what his motivations are. His motivations aren't anything good. Yeah, it's what can like, we do? Die. Like, what can we do? You can die. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> the movie cuts right through all the possible <laughs> other things and says, so I know that these are things that, like, could be yeah. a theory, but I will explain the theory yeah, to you. I'm going to make this guy talk. I want to kill you all. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, I mean, and they carry that out. I mean, they blow up all the cities, and they're not really trying to talk to anybody. Right, they and that's scary too, right? Because up until that scene with Dr. Oaken and the president um, and the alien, they hadn't blown up a city yet. No, they had blown up a city, but we. This is the first time we hear the aliens speak. How many right? cities have blown up at the point? Uh, July, July second, they took out like. Uh, I don't know. Which ships were? How many ships? Were? Yeah, I'll go oh, with but that. I, but they still like holding out like a they were still they were holding like out hope that that was the end of it. The president is hoping that they can have some kind of truce, that they can yeah. broker some kind of peace, President's and saying. there can be no truce. There will be no peace. There can be no right. peace. Yeah. So the the motivations of the alien this is pretty clear. It yeah. Says so. Right. Um, doesn't want to talk. Doesn't want to figure out how to integrate and work together. Wants to kill and take. Right. That's going back, I guess, just to what I was saying. Yeah. Or at the very beginning, like this felt like one of those movies where like. I don't think the aliens and the humans are the same species. No. Like not even, not, I shouldn't even say species. They, they don't see us as a co-species. Okay. Right. We're like not on their level. Like we think of like, like we think they think of us like locusts. Like just like we said, they think of them as locusts. I mm -hmm. mean, like this is just a locust versus locust battles where two things that are looking at each other that, that both are kind of like locusts yeah. don't recognize the other. Locusts one. versus like bow weevils or something like yeah. a smaller <laughs> kind of. Like, ants versus wasps. Ants yeah. versus wasps. Right, they just, it's too pests hives. Pests. They're just hive is much, much, much more advanced. Yeah. Okay, uh, did I see a hand? I was just yeah, saying, go ahead. You know, I wonder why the animal kingdom doesn't act this way. They eat, what I mean, do. yes, Mother mm -hmm. Nature is extremely violent at times, but I mean, they seem fair. Mm -hmm. They're not looking to destroy, This is fair. You know. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing That's unfair about this, technically. Don't take what they don't need. There's nothing unfair so about this, technically. So they're going to hunt as a pack, and saying, they're going to take preparing. down the weakest of your pack, and then their pack can eat. Their survival of the fittest. And that survival of the fittest. They don't go we work together, we take out the weak. Power and greed mm -hmm. that, like, That's what the aliens are doing. Right, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> the the locust, I guess, would be the example in the animal kingdom of something that like spreads and spreads. Or uh, could, like what's the what's that plant that you would get in Sim Park? Kudzu, uh, kudzu. Yeah, right. Where it's this one, like it spreads and takes over. It's this viney plant. I played a, I played a lot of Sim Park in elementary school. It was fun though. Hot dog stand was good too. You know, there's a uh, certain kind of worm that if it grows in the garden, yeah. you have to burn everything because you'll never have a plant. Um, uh, I learned, I was in uh, Florida and I learned about the lionfish and how it's an invasive species and how yeah. uh, a male and female lionfish can produce two million offspring oh. and how in the 80s, people brought them over from the Pacific and they have no natural predators here. So now they've gone from being non-existent to all the way up and down the uh, eastern coast of North and South America. I um, mean, they're very tasty also. 
Um, if you look at the evasive vines, which I think everybody, mm -hmm. as you drive, look out your windows. Yeah. Along the highway, you will see every tree is being taken down by vines. It looks like, yeah. um, if it's you the open your eyes and look at this, it's, it's insane, the invasive vines. Um, it looks like spider webs yeah. over, and they're pulling down and killing all the trees. And the problem is that these vines came like from some birds from a different area that pooped the seed that already had the seed in them. Mm -hmm. And this vine grows like, I mean, we hack them down with machetes at yeah. Fort Acres. And it's still killing everything. The trees, when we get them down, have um, scars in them from the circular things. Yeah, the the vines are actually like anacondas. They, yeah. they choke every, all life, right? Oh, yeah. And if you drive up and down the hutch, or the Bronx River, any of the highways, and you look at the trees now because the Parks Department isn't going to do, you know, what normal people do for their land. So any land that is not maintained or government owned now mm -hmm. is actually Protected all the trees are being taken down by these insane invasive vines. And like the tentacles on that kind of remind me of like the way the vines wrap and just rip everything down. And as people become, this is the thing, you become accustomed to seeing that. Mm -hmm. You don't notice it. You don't realize trees don't look normal. And then all of a sudden, Oh, oh the trees have come down, and we have no protection from the rain. Okay. Our wetlands yeah. are gone, and now we're flooding like we are now. So I think that there's a lot of things that are right in front of us that we are so used to and desensitized to that we don't even notice mm -hmm. can be a problem. And that's how things seep in and locust everywhere because people it become complacent too. to it yeah. and it is gradual but then all of a sudden yeah. boom, the explosion of it you know like you don't see a flower open but when, you know yeah. two days it's open mm -hmm. and then boom it's called the yeah it's called in a lot of ways like humanity is charged with like the stewardship of the natural order right uh policing invasive invasive species right like it's us who needs to be responsible for like cleaning up those messes right like we don't think of ourselves as part of it yeah well, we caused it. It wouldn't be that case if it wasn't for us. So if we don't clean up our mess, it's like it's like having a newborn and not teaching them how to clean their butt. Well, we didn't. Right. You know, like, we didn't cause the bird I mean, to come up. Yeah, we don't, no, yeah, we don't make the bird came poop. No, those came because people brought them on boats. When we're gone. Yeah, and perhaps. Their but, they, but they have this in, in, Same thing in the south. It's called, the, it's called the kudzu. And it's that's what I was trying to say. That's the word I was trying to say. It's the kudzu. And it's, park, it's been happening for... The, that's the vine she's talking oh, vine. about. It's referred to as the kudzu. And I, I mean, we can't stop the, the birds that are native species from the south to fly up here. And, and No, but it didn't come from here. It came from across the ocean, and we brought it on the boats mm -hmm. in cages from their countries when they emigrated here. That's why we're not allowed to bring animals anymore <laughs> into the country when you come in. Even a snake they won't let you bring. Because... This is the problem. That animal never would have found its way to this continent. Right. And now that it's on this continent, there's nothing to stop it. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're all kind of saying similar things. In the movie, uh, I mean, uh, did we cause the alien invasion? I guess you could argue, like, sending signals out yeah. into space, we right? Brought the to attention come. to us. We uh, final <laughs> thought, and then I want to talk about why we love America. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> on, the, on, the note of, on the note of how these okay. extraterrestrials are yeah, portrayed compared to extraterrestrials in other movies, uh -huh. um, I think that these guys and the xenomorphs from Ridley Scott's alien movies uh -huh. are two halves of the same coin. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, in the H. sense Giger, that, like, in the artists. sense that the these guys they seem to have more of like a society and they're more tech based and yeah. their bodies aren't as formidable, but their minds seem to be what makes them special and dangerous. Mm -hmm. Where on the other end, the xenomorphs are just like. We're killing machines. We cannot be stopped. We evolve to adapt to whatever environment, and we will change ourselves to whatever environment is necessarily like necessary. Our blood is corrosive to literally everything else. Yeah. Like even killing us is difficult. Like whatever we have to do to just go to your like they do the same thing. Like we go to your planet and take it, but they do it in different ways. Like okay. they both operate with a queen, but they do it in different ways. Like they're both really unknowable and silent. But they, they do that in different ways. Like, one is more of an animal, mm -hmm. and the other one is just more of, like, a, a person. Yeah, like, a person that you don't know their language or culture or their food or what they eat or what they like or their music. Mm -hmm. um, you can't relate. You can't, you can't relate. relate. Yeah, like, one, one is a predator, and the other one is just, like, you can't relate. Exactly. And that's how I've always compared them in my mind, where, like, they're two 
of the most fleshed out ways to show aliens like malef like malevolent aliens on screen, mm -hmm. but they just do it in just two of the most polar opposite ways possible. Okay. I'm also thinking of the, the bugs from Men in Black now, because now I'm just thinking about What about, about the Black. arachnids from uh, Starship Troopers? Starship Troopers? Uh, Starship Troopers is a good or movie to talk about one Star day. Or the Borg from Star Trek. The Borg is interesting, right, because of the, the, the merger with technology being a part of that collective, because yeah, the Borg is like a future. Yeah, they're basically the same thing as the Borg, aside yeah. from Queens. They, uh, no, Borg no, the Borg's got a queen. Yeah, the Borg do have, and she was high. And the aliens have a, <laughs> it's implied that there's like well, a, Picard, a Clyde. Picard was all over that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe. He became the, the cutest. But, um, yeah. Okay, no, 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 I, I, that's, that's definitely a good you point. Know, you know, once, once you got Borg, you can't even talk about Andrew's games. <laughs> <laughs> once you right. go Borg, you don't let's, uh, let's, for the sake of time, we got 15 minutes. Let's hear Bill Pullman say some nice words, and then, yes. and then try to, Mankind. That's what I've been meaning. Uh, yeah, it's something with the sound editing. When he says the word survive, like it, it, I hear it, I feel it resonate through me. Uh, like hair on the back of my neck. That's stands called the up. spirit, sir. Yeah, oh, that's right. It's the, it's the American. It's the American spirit. No, I think it is something with the way they edited the sound. Like they know what they're doing. Uh, extra points, because again, the, the points aren't real and nobody wins. But uh, extra points if you know uh, the poem that uh, President Whitmore is plagiarizing from. It's the one from it's the one Dylan Thomas, right? Where he's writing uh, to his father who's uh, dying, and he's like, do not go gently into that good night. You know, rage against the light. School? Yeah. The it's a similar time period. It's the Rodney Dangerfield back to school play. Oh. <laughs> she gets the points. Right. All right. No, no, yeah. No, you're right. Um, okay. Uh, this is a very American movie, right? Uh, Independence Day. It takes place primarily in America. We see shots over the world, right? But m most of it is, is in the United States. Um, and it is about us responding to a new threat, right? So Having to fight for our freedom yet again. And what I'd like us to think about in the final, uh, I don't know, let's say five minutes, uh, so how is patriotism handled in this movie? And how is America and its place in the world, its people, how are they portrayed in this film? Let's hear from five people, because then I want to talk about world peace. One. World peace. Um, <laughs> I think that patriotism is portrayed in this movie pretty dead on to how it is in this world, right? Okay. Um, in this country, there's a group of people that are very patriotic, right? Okay. Um, there is no forced enlistment like in other countries. So therefore, um, like in this movie, you're going to have people who enlisted and are going to be very patriotic for their country, and then mm -hmm. you're going to have the people who want nothing to do with it and just expect to be... Secured, you sure. know, um, and I think it goes a lot to say about our country. Again, I'm from Italy, and there everybody serves two years. Yeah, male, female, whatever you are. So when you're talking about going to war and fighting a big threat, it's every mother and father talking about their kid. Mm -hmm. It's not just a certain people in the country that need to be worried. So therefore, in those countries, they're a lot more aware of what's going on mm -hmm. politically. They have a lot more to say about. Um, what their country is doing in terms of going to war and with their children because everybody's kid is going to experience this, right? In this country, it's left for the kids who want a free education and feel like that they need to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of my friends, their family pushed them to go into the military because they didn't have money for college and you're going to go on the GI Bill, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and a lot of my friends went to Afghanistan because of this. Um, and then I had friends that played ball and they're like, I don't want nothing to do with that. I'm going to go on a ball scholarship, you know? And then you just have the military families who have the patriotism and they want their children to follow in their yeah. footsteps, right? That's really what our country, who defends our country. And I think that says a lot about our patriotism because the people who defend your country are the ones that are going to be patriotic. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are going to be worried about everything that we're doing and they're the ones that are going to want to have the services for veterans and everything like that because not every family in this country is invested. So the service for veterans is not the same and the care isn't the same and the thought of the military is not the same. Okay. And I think that is very well portrayed in this film. Yeah. Um, to segregate that, and I think it's really important because this is not how other countries work. And because we do this in this country, we have a very split thing. We have people that are completely unpatriotic and have no idea what people are serving and sacrificing for mm -hmm. their butt, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and you have a lot of people that just don't pay attention or fight and have a voice and go out and, 
and say, we're not going to go to war, we're not going to occupy this country, we're not going to do that, because it's not their kids and they don't really care. Okay. And I think that that was really well shown in this one. Showing the, the division. Showing the division and also the kind of sex of people mm -hmm. that were the very patriotic and the people that just, you know, expected to just be saved. And why aren't you saving me? And that's your job to save me. And I shouldn't save myself. Okay. You know? Greg, and then we'll go here. Yeah, I think that one of the... The things I noticed, I mean, just from the time frame, this came out in the 90s, and there was like a lot of, I think this was like a rebranding of patriotism. Because yeah. in the 80s, uh, almost every movie that was like an action or war movie was an anti US imperialist Vietnam movie. Mm. Platoon, 1986, which was 10 years before. We this. have a Vietnam vet as a, as a B level right. character and, and in this, yeah. In this movie, they, they, like, it became sort of like an, having movies that were big budget movies that showed patriotic people was a bad thing. Starting with Stripes, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then going all the way up through anything in the late 80s. But in this movie, this is very pro-America, very, very patriotic, very everything else, but it's toned down. Yeah. It's not like we're the, like the, it, I, although the, obviously the movie is geared towards an American audience, so the characters are all gonna be American, they still like reach out to everybody else. There's no an animosity with other countries. Right. That's like completely washed over on this. And it's like, it's okay to be pro-patriotic as long as it's gonna be a World Independence Day. He actually ends the thing saying like, this is like a global thing. Yeah. That really, our like, day would be the whole world day. Yeah, our yes. day would be the world day. So it's sort of like a, like a We day. don't think we're the best, we just are the we best. We are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have Jeff Goldblum. Right, we got Jeff yeah. Goldblum <laughs> and Will Smith. Uh, Jeff, and then we'll go here. Yeah, no, you, it, it, he, you beat me to it. Like, I was just gonna say like, it, it would be really hard oh, boy, making yeah. this movie in 2019 because they tried in 2016 and it didn't turn yeah, out so like, well. It's, yeah. no, like, no, it's, it's rough because like if, you know, like markets like China, yeah. You know, are are now considered so much when you make these big budget blockbuster movies oh. to the point where, you know, like if you were going to do this today, like you would probably call it like Battle World and then like it would be about like like you know, you wouldn't have the president of the United States, you'd probably have like a UN summit mm -hmm. where you would speak to all the leaders of the world or something like that because you have to consider all of the different markets when you're making something like this and they yeah. kind of get into that with the whole this is this isn't just our independence day it's a world independence day but even still like you know the all the references to july you know second and july 4th mm -hmm. and all of that and i imagine that in 1996 there were people in america going to see this movie t twice yeah. three times four, it four rained times that weekend, yeah I and Wait, you know no that doesn't that doesn't happen as much anymore. Mm -hmm. That doesn't so like on a meta level of how they make movie, this yeah. is sort of like a last bastion of that insular sort of American idea of this is a summer movie. Yeah. This is what we're gonna do as America. Like you're gonna go eat a hot dog and then you're gonna go see Independence Day. Like that's what you're gonna do. And it made a billion dollars essentially mm -hmm. on that idea. And it's funny Except you mentioned China, America. right? Because in that sequel I'm not gonna talk about, uh, China it played a big role. And it is, it's because China put a lot of money into that movie. And Batman mm -hmm. in the Dark Knight went to Hong Kong and to get Lao. And like it's because these movies are investing a lot of money and now we're not just seeing uh, big Hollywood movies being used as U.S. propaganda, right? Like, if you've got the money, if you've got the market, like oh, China please. does, right? Like, China's been really important, and China's going to help us save the day. Uh, and th that says well, something about where we like are culturally. But, yeah, yeah, like in the Martian, yeah. China, China has this other ship. We just, they, you know, yeah. yeah why build one when you build Because you have to kind of sort of build that in now. They, but China's secretly advanced in a lot of movies, right? Like yes. in The Martian, where it's like, we you didn't realize it, but look how great we are. Look, um, okay, uh, you're number four, and then we got one more. Okay. I was just gonna say, from a historical perspective, this was after the first Iraq war. Yes. Sort of a coalition piece, mm -hmm. which, with a lot of international cooperation, which is, I think, what this is kind of tapping into a little bit. Okay, yeah, because I, the Iraqi desert is the first uh, like global shot we're seeing in that scene. Well, that scene was cut from I, yeah. in, in Israel and various parts of the Middle East because <laughs> it showed Israeli people and Iraqi pilots working together. Yeah. So. <laughs> right, yeah. Like the, yeah, we're, like, we're, get, we're coming to world peace, don't worry. I see you. Um, okay. Uh, all right, listen. This movie... 
sets out uh, an outline for what we need in terms of world peace. And just like the graphic novel Watchmen, what it argues is that the, as, a, as a human race, we will never be united. We will always be fighting each other unless we have that external outside force. And spoilers for the Watchmen graphic novel, right? They fake an alien invasion, and that's what yeah, ends the Cold is, War. That's before um, yeah. this movie was released. So yes. That was kind of like right. way ahead of it. Yeah, I know, absolutely. And in the movie version of Watchmen, they tweak it so yeah, it's like, yeah, they make it look yeah. like it was the superhero that actually did it. Yeah, and I think it works better with that absolutely. idea of the alien invasion, because you see it again in this movie. And I think that's something really to think about, that we are so similar, right? We, as humans on this planet, despite like uh, economic differences and other th ideological and differences, race, color, creed, right, orientation, right? We are so similar, and yet it will take something more different from us to, to show us that, uh, that similarities and to get us to finally work together. And in the sequel that I'm not going to talk about, that's what they have done. They've had no global conflict in 20 years. They've set up this moon defense thing with people from the UN in space. Um, and I don't know if we'll ever get to that, but it's something to consider that it, we're never going to stop fighting each other until we go to space. Uh, OK, I'm sorry. I've, I've been violently waved at by future Mrs. <laughs> Professor movies. Um, so um, this movie says a lot of things. I think I, I, we've summarized it. I'm, I'm speeding through these things. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for sharing your ideas. Thank you for being a part of this class. Um, we will meet again on August 2nd. Uh, there was an Instagram poll to decide uh, next Alien. month's film. Yeah. Uh, next uh, month's theme is robots, because we haven't talked about robots yet. Um, the, the finalists were uh, T2 and Ex Machina. Uh, the drum roll. Short drum roll. <laughs> and the winner is. Oh, wait, no, it's Ex Machina. Like I said, if you care about these things and you really want to uh, have a voice for September, right, uh, I encourage you to vote on uh, my Instagram, this one, because I think there's a lot of uh, cheating. I suspect some there illusion. Is. Uh, see, she knows. All right, well, thank you guys for being here. Let's give each other a round of applause.